The medical profession may be doing harm to patients and communities. Many years ago, as a first year medical student, I took an oath, like thousands of physicians before me and thousands of physicians after me, that I would first do no harm to the patients and the communities that I serve. And since then, I have committed my career for taking care of patients in underserved communities just like this one on the Near East Side of Columbus, Ohio. But over time, I've seen that the medical profession has broken that social contract with the communities that we serve because of racism and placism. Now, this is going to be best illustrated if I walk you through the lives of two of my dear friends. So first, let me tell you who they are. Many years ago, as a young, aspiring physician, new to practice, I started my career off in Connecticut, where I had the good fortune of meeting two wonderful women who would become lifelong friends and honestly like family. And it is through their lenses that I will walk you through the impact of racism and placism in medicine. So first, I want you to meet Wendy. Wendy's a black woman. I met Wendy as a middle-aged mother, hard-working woman, working so hard to provide for her kids. Through my relationship with Wendy, I've learned so much about tenacity, grit, and honesty. I also want you to meet Sarah. Sarah's a white woman. I also met her as a middle-aged woman, a mother, hardworking, did so much to provide for her family as well. And through my friendship with Sarah, I've learned so much about allyship and loyalty. Now, when I met Wendy and Sarah, they lived about six miles apart in central Connecticut. Sarah in the wealthier suburbs outside of West Hartford, and Wendy in the inner city outside of East Hartford. Although they only lived six miles apart, their potential interactions with the healthcare system could not have been any more different because of racism and placism. So let's talk about what those mean and what those look like in medicine. Racism in medicine means that Wendy, as a black woman, would be much less likely to have positive interactions with the healthcare system, much less likely to be taken seriously by doctors, and much less likely to have state-of-the-art healthcare wherever she lived. Because in medical school, we are taught that black patients have a higher threshold for pain. If Wendy came to my office with presenting with pain, as a black woman, she would be significantly less likely to have that pain addressed. Similarly, if Wendy, as a black woman, presented to the emergency department with crushing chest pain, she would be 50% less likely to receive any life-saving intervention for a heart attack. Now, in medicine and in nursing, we're often taught to discount and discredit the symptoms of black women. So if Wendy, as a black woman, went through her pregnancy, she would be three to four times as likely to die in that pregnancy or in the childbirth than Sarah would as a white woman. Similarly, if Wendy gave birth to a baby, she would be twice as likely to bury her baby before the age of one than Sarah would as a white woman. And if Wendy gave birth to a black baby and that baby was taken care of by a white physician, that baby would have an increased risk of dying in that first year. Racism in medicine also means that although Wendy, as a black woman, would be much less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer or colon cancer, if she were diagnosed, she would be diagnosed with much more advanced disease, later stage disease, and have a 50% higher mortality than Sarah as a white woman. And so it's not really the phenotype of race, it's the structures of racism that would lead Wendy to toxic accumulation of stress that would lead her to earlier heart disease than Sarah. So racism is taking its toll in medicine. Now the other issue is placism. And by placism, I mean the ignorance of a person's place, where they live, their zip code, on their health. We know that 80% of a person's health status is determined by social determinants of health, not their interaction with me as their doctor. The conditions where they live, work, play, school, housing, economic security, jobs, safety, violence. But chances are your doctor has looked at you and made a decision on how they will care for you based on your race, but they have never paid attention to your place or your zip code. So this, is, this shows up in significant health disparities in life expectancy. If you look at the state of Ohio, in green, you'll see the wealthier parts of the state. People have a life expectancy into their late 80s, almost into their 90s. Not too far from some of these same places in red, you see that people have a life expectancy in their 60s. So there can be a 29-year difference in your life expectancy based on where you live. Now, if we zoom in on where I am right now in central Ohio, 
the life expectancy challenges are the same. You can see places that are not that far away have over 27 years of a difference in life expectancy between the poorer and the wealthier zip codes. Where I'm standing right now on the Near East Side of Columbus, Ohio, a mile away in a wealthier suburb of Bexley, people are expected to live 18 years longer than the people in the community that I'm standing in. Chances are, no matter where you are in the United States, these same health disparities exist. These same problems based on your place exist. So back to Wendy and Sarah. When I met Wendy and Sarah, they lived about six miles apart. But that meant that Sarah was expected to live to the age of 84, and Wendy to the age of 68, a 16-year difference based on six miles. So you may wonder, what if we just moved Wendy over to where Sarah lived? Would that change? Unfortunately, because racism would follow her, Wendy's life expectancy would not change. It would be as if Wendy lived in the same place for her whole life. And that is because racism is the father of placism. Placism is the derivative of racism. Structural housing discrimination, redlining, and many other structural factors have led to the reasons why people in certain communities have lower life expectancies. So how then can I have lifelong friendships with Wendy and Sarah? I want us all to live and have our relationships until we're in our 80s. This is where I believe that we can make a difference through changes in education and leveraging technology. So with education, we need to dismantle and deconstruct racist, oppressive, prejudicial, biased education that we provide to medical students, nursing students, and other health profession students. The same mythology and stereotypes that were used to justify slavery are still used in medicine today. We need to dismantle and deconstruct that sort of education and instead replace it with anti-racist, anti-oppressive, scientifically focused, stereotype-free, and informed care that allows us to give equitable care to our patients. But what do we do then if we change the educational system? We know educational reform takes a long time. What do we do about the thousands and thousands of physicians Physicians like me who are not going back to school anytime soon, but they have been unfortunately indoctrinated with these awful stereotypes and beliefs about their patients. This is where I believe the second solution can help us. Technology can help us be anti-racist and anti-places. So what might this look like? Chances are if you go to a doctor's office, they are using an electronic medical record where they're collecting so much information about you. And I believe that we can use clinical decision algorithms that will allow us to be anti-racist and anti-places at the point of taking care of you. Because most doctors have looked at your race, but they have not asked about your place. So what would this look like in real life? Let's say a patient, Molly, came to my office. And in the course of care, which is customary, my medical assistant, before I see her, would collect her height, her weight, her blood pressure, and ask her about her pain on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being little pain and 10 being her worst pain. What if Molly said she had a 7 out of 10 pain, but as often happens to black patients, I didn't pay attention to it? What if the technology could call that pain to my attention and stop me before I could do anything else in that electronic health record and say, studies tell us that black women are much less likely to have their pain addressed. Are you sure you do not want to address Molly's pain? I could say, yes, I'm sure. I do not want to address her pain. I want to be racist. Or I could go back and I could do something different. Similarly, if I was not managing her high blood pressure with the top-of-the-line agents, we know that black patients often get the third or the fourth-line agent for their hypertension. What if the technology stopped me here, too, and forced me to be anti-racist and, and reminded me that African-American patients are much less likely to be, get prescribed first-line agents? Are you sure you do not want to change Molly's medication? I could say, yes, I'm sure. I want to continue to be racist, or I could go back and do something different. Same thing could, could apply to colon cancer screening if I did not screen my patient, as often happens to black patients. The system could ask me, it could force that into my consciousness, it could force me to do no harm. What can we do about placism? So chances are we have not paid attention to your zip code, nor would we know what to do with it if we saw it. So what if we use community mapping tools and a lot of the geospatial imaging that we have to tell us about social determinants of health, not only your risk based on your zip code, but also what to do about it? What if the technology called out my patient's zip code and told me that she lived in this zip code where she's likely to die early from heart disease? Will you discuss heart health and disease prevention with your patient? I could say no, I want to continue to be placist, or I could go back and do something different. I believe we can do this. I believe we can turn the tide and renew that contract with medicine. 
but it's going to take patients, institutions, and doctors to all play their part. So patients, be empowered to ask more from your doctors. You have a right to full health. Ask us to address your pain. Ask us what screenings you should be having based on your age or your gender. Ask us if we are really on the first line medications for your condition. But institutions, you also have a role. You need to retrain your doctors, your nurses, your health professionals. Deconstruct and reconstruct that educational model that you have. Teach your physicians, your nurses, your health professionals to see patients as whole people. Teach them to be humble, culturally empathetic, and to see their patients as their own. And finally, doctors, my peers, my colleagues, we took an oath. We promised our patients and our society that we would take care of them, that we would do no harm. Honor your oath and give patients the love and the care that they need. And together, we can give life, love, hope, and healing to the communities that we serve. And together, we can do no harm. Thank you.